this week on the Back Table Podcast. If we really were objective with one another as physicians, how good is a stethoscope? Is it really that good? If you actually dig into the data, it's kind of surprising how inaccurate it is, yet how much we depend on it. And yes, the old guard will be there that, that are really, really good and, and can listen with their stethoscope and tell you exactly what murmur it is. But I will tell you all day long, instead of listening and guessing, I would rather look and know. And Butterfly makes that difference. And so I absolutely will tell you the future will be there uh, in not too distant future that every single medical student will be trained with ultrasound technology, hopefully a butterfly. But that is a foregone conclusion at this point. And it's basically already becoming a determinant where students want to go to school. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on Backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Backtable Innovation Show, where you will hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist out of Silicon Valley and co-founder of an early stage medical device company in the pulmonary space. We're super excited about our special guest this week, Dr. John Martin. John is a vascular surgeon and entrepreneur, and he's also the chief medical officer of Butterfly Network. Butterfly is the world's first ultrasound on a chip working to democratize whole body ultrasound imaging. John is also the founder of arguably the world's largest vascular screening program with locations around the globe. We can't wait to hear his story. With that, John, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome. It's a pleasure to join you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks so much. So let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? Uh, what's your specialty? What's your current job? Yeah, so I live in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm fortunate to be here in this great sailing town. I, I trained at uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital. I went to medical school at UT Southwestern, did a general surgery residency there, and then did a fellowship in vascular surgery there. Uh, upon completion, I did my boards in general surgery, vascular surgery, and surgical critical care, but I spent the bulk of my career principally as a vascular surgeon. All right. Interesting. And how long did you practice? Woof. <laughs> You're making me date myself. <laughs> I so am. I, I finished my fellowship in 1991. So I've been at it a while. I guess I'm, I'm gray enough to have experience, but young enough to, to have engaged in the endovascular world and feel comfortable in both spaces. Okay. So what did your practice look like uh, before joining Butterfly? So I was a, a vascular surgeon and practiced actually in a pretty interesting position. I was the president of a, the largest cardiology group in metropolitan Washington and was one of, as I built up the practice, uh, four vascular surgeons in that practice. I was also had a role as the head of heart and vascular services at the regional medical center. And then just before joining Butterfly, I was the vice president of physician operations uh, for a large health system in the Washington area. So I've kind of danced around leadership roles, clinical roles, service line roles, as well as system level roles. And it's been a rewarding career seeing things from many of the different chairs that actually are engaged in healthcare. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sounds like you've, you've touched on a lot of roles. Uh, so what did your, your, what kind of cases were you doing day to day? Being the older guy, I had a pretty big open practice. So, you know, large carotid practice, pretty busy with aortic endografts. I would kind of a particular specialty in remote end arterectomy, which is an interesting discussion in and of itself. Um, but a combination of open and endo with probably a leaning more toward open than endo, because as we brought on new people, uh, into the practice, their endo skills were were, you know, certainly better than mine. And so I tended to shift the more complicated endo stuff to them. Interesting. And what, what is, re why don't you tell us what remote, uh, means in this case? A uh, remote end direct is great, great little operation where you actually do an open cut down of the common femoral artery. And this is for long total occlusions of the superficial femoral artery. And with tools, some of which actually I developed, you actually core out the plaque and pull it out in one great big long piece and then tack down the endpoint with a stent and then patch close the common femoral artery. Great little operation uh, that's really good for total occlusions. Um, and, and candidly, probably even better today with, with the drug-coated balloons that are there because obviously the Achilles heel of any endovascular procedure, intimal hyperplasia. But uh, a fun operation, technically challenging, but fun to perform. All right. So, so you've had a pretty broad career from a vascular surgery standpoint number of leadership roles. Uh, tell me, where does entrepreneurship fit in? How, how did you get into to becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, when did that start? You know, it started early for me, even actually, and I guess depends on how you define the category entrepreneurship, but started for me in my fellowship when I engaged in a, there was a new procedure called 
uh, angioscopic side branch occlusion for distal bypasses. And I got to work early with uh, Dr. Tom Fogarty, who obviously is no, no stranger to most people in this space. And, and I got to work early in the development of that technique and teaching other people how to do it. And that kind of got me started in the world of entrepreneurship from there. It branched out into many different areas, some more successful than others. But I think we found, like many surgeons do, that the pushing that you get ideas in the OR and taking care of people and, and you kind of get this bug to explore those ideas and try to develop them. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's exactly what Dr. Fogarty says as well. Uh, you know, he was a, he was a mechanic uh, or was an engineer back in the day around the time when he was, he was a vascular technologist. That's, that's how he got started. But he always talks about curiosity and just trying to solve problems. And I think that's where his, you know, the Fogarty balloon came from taking the little, uh, the ends of gloves of the, the, the latex gloves, sewing them together to create a, the first balloon. Well, th that's such a great story too, because, you know, he was discouraged by many to pursue that. In fact, I'm sure as you've, you've heard the story, you know, was considered kind of a fool in the process of doing it and told that that would never work. And I think that stories and the stories he shared with me were really important in the journey to entrepreneurship because you don't want to get discouraged. I think you need to believe in your ideas and, and believe in yourself. And I think that's the difference between those that succeed and those that just have good ideas and never go anywhere. The other interesting story from him along the way and really important for entrepreneurship is knowing when is a product and new idea a product and when is it a company? which is also a really interesting lesson to learn along the way. Oh, that's a fantastic point. Uh, maybe you can uh, give us a, a short uh, snippet of what his thoughts were there. Well, I think you need to understand how big the marketplace can be for, for what you're developing and then whether or not this is something you take on on your, your own or whether you're better served with you know a bigger company partner who actually can invest the resources, invest in the development of the product and take it to be part of a portfolio of a bigger company. Um, the nuance between those two things are sometimes difficult to determine, but it's an important part of the process along the way. And it, it's an interesting lesson to learn because you also don't want to ride your own pony for too long, uh, particularly if there's someone else can, can help steer the horse for you and get you where you want to go faster. And I think the other lesson about it is don't be greedy. You know, don't want to see that it, it needs to be all about you. If you believe in the technology and believe it's going to help people then understanding that others bringing that to fruition can help more lives, help more surgeons, help more patients. Sometimes that's a better route to take. But understanding the difference between the two is a nuanced thing that I'm sure over time, you, you know, you take your lumps, uh, but sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. And I think that's important. That's a great point. This is actually, I think, the second time this has come up in this series, understanding the difference between a, uh, a business or a company and a product. So Definitely take it to heart out there because uh, it's, it's one that can cause you a lot of pain or it can, be, it can be the answer to your problems if you can find a company to partner with if it becomes more of a product than a company. So, all right, tell us your story of entrepreneurship from, from then on. Well, the, the next chapter for me was I actually went into the Air Force. I got called into the military during the Gulf War. I had an obligation to serve. Um, so... Into the military, I went and, and we had, I was trying to start a vascular lab at the hospital that I was at, which was Andrews Air Force Base. At the time I went there, we sent out all of our vascular studies because no vascular labs were done. And, you know, as a vascular surgeon, certainly a vascular lab is kind of a cornerstone of what we do. And in the process, we ultimately were able to get a machine and open up a lab with a tech, but I found myself dictating lots of reports. And at that time I thought, this is kind of silly. I, I say the same things over and over again. And it was obvious to me that maybe a better solution was to have a software program where I could automate a lot of this stuff. But I didn't, I didn't know anything about computer program, never taken a computer programming course in my life. But what I started doing was going down to the corner store and buying software programs, reading the manuals and trying to decide whether or not I could code. Uh, Cause I laid out in my eyes, in my mind, how I would want it to work. And then I tried to code it. And I went through two or three or four programs till I settled upon one called Fox Pro. And I actually could figure out how to do Fox Pro. So I started coding at nighttime. And with every copy of the program, they would give you 90 days of customer support. So uh, whatever I'd read in the manual, if I got stuck, I called customer support at nighttime. And I got to be quite familiar with all the help people. Um, and they would say things like, hey, doc, what are you working on tonight? Uh, and when I got to the end of 90 days, I'd just buy another copy of the program so I could get through another 90 days. And so literally I had three or four copies before I had a finished product. And then I started using it in our own lab. And that was kind of the start. 
a number of people would see it and come by and I would talk about it. I actually even tried to get some of the major manufacturers to support its development. Nobody thought that that would fly at the time. And so I was committed to it. So I did another one of those important steps in entrepreneurship is I was committed enough to take out a second mortgage in my home and hire a real coding company to take the structure of what I had and put it into professional code that was something that I could sell. So that, that was a big, deep breath and go <laughs> step for me. Um, Unbelievable. But it worked. It actually worked. And, and uh, I formed a company uh, and started the software and we started selling it. And candidly, we did well enough, even with this tiny little company while I was practicing um, in the military and thereafter, once I got out, to kind of help support putting my kids uh, into private schools and supporting them as I started my career. So, and that program, interestingly enough, is still runs today in many institutions across the country. Someone else now owns the company. I was able to, to sell it, but it was a great example to me that if you commit to something and you believe it and you got something that really works, uh, it actually can uh, prove to go on to fruition, but you got to bet on yourself sometimes. I think that's, a, that's such a, a great point, betting on yourself. So there are a number of things to unpack with what you, you just talked about there. Uh, I am so interested that you, and this was in the, the 90s, the early 90s? Early 90s early 90s when computers were really just getting going, personal computing, and you decided that you wanted to learn to code. I have probably not a lot of people, especially physicians who were doing that at the time. And I think that's, uh, that's remarkable. And then to say, take a second mortgage on your house to pay for this, that's quite a leap of faith. Now, tell me, how did it work with your practice, with your family? How were you able to do all this? How'd you con convince your family that this was the right move? Well, I, I think it comes into to trust and believing in each other. I think that's kind of the, the game. I, I was convinced it was right. It made logical sense. I mean, there were a lot of really interesting things we did in that program. So, you know, you would, it would automate, for instance, the interpretation, if you will, you in vascular surgery, and you know this, for instance, in grading carotids, we were able to embed the criteria for a mild, moderate, severe. So all you had to do was download the velocities from the machine into the fields. It automatically graded the stenosis for you and created the interpretation. So you would put in 250 over 125, it would plop in automatically critical stenosis. And then the interpretation was critical right and internal carotid artery stenosis. So I didn't have to dictate, I didn't have to do anything. I mean, it, literally I would review the report. Obviously you could edit it, but all I had to do was hit sign and you could literally within the system, put them in a callback schedule, get all the information for accreditation. You could actually bill because the ICD-9 and CPT codes were, were in the program itself. And it did retrospective comparisons to previous studies, so highlighted when things progressed. And so there was enough there to bet on it, but it did take a leap of faith from everyone around me to believe in doing this. And the practice obviously benefited from it because I brought the software into the practice and it, it helped our lab grow and the efficiency grow because people weren't sitting around dictating. Incredible. But so uh, one thing I want to highlight, it seems like you almost had a minimum viable product that you created on your own. So while it was a leap of faith, you also had some early feedback that it could be successful, correct? Yeah, and I think it gets to any time you develop something, it's critically important that, you know, kind of before you roll it out in front of people, something that gives you a proof of concept is a really big step. I, you know, just an idea, people look at you, there's lots of people that have ideas. But if you do the hard work of getting a, a proof of concept, and, and that is kind of a formula that I've played over and over again throughout my career, you get attention, people take you seriously, and you got a much better chance of being successful if you do that. So it's a matter of do the hard work up front, get a proof of concept before you get it in front of people. I think that's a valuable lesson for all entrepreneurs. Wow. Yeah, I totally agree. And so how long did this process take, would you Oof. say, from when you came up with the idea until you, you ended up selling uh, the company and kind of passing it on? passing the torch uh, it, on. That whole process went over a, approximately about four to five years um, with different companies as partners. But from concept uh, to development, it was about a year and a half of staying up at nighttime, um, coding away, trial and error, testing it the next day, working back and forth with the coders. Because even once I offloaded the, uh, to, uh, if you will, the formal coding, there was still a lot of work back and forth on, on trying to make sure that it worked the way I wanted it to work. One of the interesting pro problems with software and everybody using Epic today or Cerner or pick any of them, no software written by just software people doesn't think like doctors. And then what you, what you really need is that unique combination of software that thinks like we practice, but is coded with great expertise. And I think that's what made this product uh, so user-friendly and so successful. 
um, because it actually worked the way we worked. Wow. Have you kept up with any coding? Did you do any more efforts after that uh, with your coding? Yeah. So then I did a second program, um, and this was really around outcomes very early on. In fact, I started this project about the same time I did the smaller one with the lab. I truly believed at some point people were truly going to pay attention to clinical outcomes, financial outcomes, and patient satisfaction, you know, the triple aim, if you will. And I believe that, that the best way actually to get to that was to create software and track all that information. And so I literally went to, to an appliance store, got them to give me a refrigerator box, um, unfolded that whole box, lined the entire thing with saran wrap, and then got boxes and boxes of three by five cards that I used to build out what the database would actually look like and what its structure was for an outcomes program for vascular interventions. And then went on my way actually building that one and ultimately with the same company writing that program as well. I never, wow. I never commercially released it, but used it in all my practices. It became an invaluable tool to build our practice. We had more information about what we did than almost anybody practicing uh, vascular surgery. Wow. So you basically built a storyboard or whiteboard out of refrigerator boxes. That's uh, correct. So, th so that you could visualize the whole workflow and the, the database and how it would work. It made it much easier for the coders to just kind of look at it and then they could structure it because they could see how I had set everything up, move the pieces around, what worked, what didn't work. But we did a lot of complex things. So you, you're a radiologist, you, you know about interventional procedures and interventional coding. When you do a whole bunch of different procedures, there's a whole litany of codes that you use. What we were able to do was, was be able to code automatically just based on catheter position and the things that you did. And it structured the coding in a way that optimized both reimbursement as well as actually tell the real accurate story about what you did. Wow, that seems like something that I think only probably became more important as the years went on. You may have even been a little early for that. I was, I was too early. There's no question I was too early. You were ahead of, you were ahead were, of the curve. On that one, I, I was. You know, a real interesting story, I'll tell you just quickly um, about how, why that was so important. So we had one of our vascular surgeons who all of a sudden their badge uh, for radiation started reading higher. And we couldn't understand why. Why all of a sudden would that be the case? So what we did was dug into the database quickly and looked at the breakdown of all the procedures that he did. And you looked at the distribution of procedures and you go, okay, well, that hasn't changed much, but let's look at it in the deeper. And we were able to do this just at, I literally, this literally took me three minutes to solve. So I looked deeper and looked at the dialysis cases that he was doing because he did a lot of interventional dialysis cases. And I was able to see that in his dialysis cases, there was a shift from those that were preventive, i.e. before it failed, to, you know, reactive after it failed and had to do an intervention. And there was a shift in the numbers. So they were more commonly being done after clotted than pre-clotted. So then I tracked back from that, why all of a sudden did that happen? And I could pinpoint a time, reached out to the dialysis centers where they came from and discovered that they had stopped doing the monitoring of their fistulas and grafts. Oh my gosh. And so I was instant and I literally solved that dilemma in three minutes because I could look at the cases down to exactly how they were done where they were coming from, could make that phone call. And we literally knew instantly what the problem was. You can't do that inside Epic or almost any other software program that was out there. So it was a great example of the power of having data down to a, a minute detail to solve clinical problems. What a great example of uh, the use of data science there to solve real world problems. That is fantastic. So I'm surprised it didn't, how hard did you try to market this? <laughs> did you... I mean, it sounds very useful. I can imagine this, a lot of practices would be interested. Or actually, I, I assume your target market would be other private groups, hospital-based groups. Yeah, and I think this was the other valuable lesson for me because I, I didn't really go all in on this one. By that point, farther along in my career, different administrative roles, and I just didn't really invest in this as I should. I didn't build a company or people around it. And so ultimately you could see other products that came out, Vascu base, and then the SVS came up with its own thing. None of which came, quite frankly, I thought were, were as good still to this day, don't think they're as good, but they had more infrastructure around it, more support around it than, than I did in my own little place, you know, but I, it was a valuable lesson for me that if I'm really going to do something like this, you, there, there's a part of you that has to go all in, or it's just going to end up being kind of a local thing. And so yeah. it was another part of the learning for me along the way. Speaking of going all in, it seems like you went all in on your screening program. Can you tell us, uh, just based on the outcome, can you tell us how transition to how that 
how you started that and uh, how it grew to become the 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 giant that it is. So it, it's interesting, and 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 I really do appreciate the nice things you said. It is probably the largest free uh, and longest running cardiovascular. There are screening programs that are bigger that are for profit that everybody's quite familiar with, but nobody's done it for free like we have, nor the scope that we have. And so this screening program, which is not that novel, you know, we screen for carotid artery disease, aortic aneurysms, and peripheral arterial disease, and we do blood pressure checks, and and then in evening programs, cholesterol checks and risk stratification. But it grew out of one night. This is another thing about your ideas. One night I came in and was called in to see a ruptured aneurysm and the patient died in the emergency room. And then before I left, I was asked to see a carotid patient that had had a stroke who had a critical stenosis that, that hadn't been discovered. And then before I left, somebody else came in on the thumper for CPR and that having a heart attack. So I it was with that. And driving home, I was just frustrated. I was really frustrated. And my father had talked to me actually serendipitously a couple of days before about he went to lifeline screening. And so I'm driving home going, you know, I believe in the idea of screening. I just don't believe in the way they did it. I want to do something different. So I literally came in the next day and told my team, we're going to do a free va cardiovascular screening program. Um, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to do lectures with it. We're going to have a big part of education. It's going to be free for everybody. Um, and we're going to target an elevated risk population. And by the way, as everybody looked at me like I had four heads, we're going to do no self-referral. So everybody we screen is going back to their primary care doctor. If they want to send them to us, great. If not, we don't care. Our goal is just to find disease and try to risk stratify things. So literally weeks later, we had our first evening program. It was packed. I was doing it quarterly with people and volunteers. We started to mature the program. And then I decided at this pace, I'm trying to boil the ocean. So let's do something different. I did another one of those big steps. I set up a not-for-profit. I went out and raised money. I did a big kickoff event with sponsors from, from the medical device, from pharma, from industry, from the bar association, from local, the speaker of the house of Maryland and the senator and the mayor. Got all these people behind us and we kicked off a program with the idea of screening every single at-risk person in our legislative district. So big dreams. And from there, candidly, it's taken off. You know, it, it became a full-time foundation screening four to five days a week. We, we published our results in the Journal of Vascular Surgery and people came in to see the program, to learn how to do it. So we started sharing the ideas. And then the next thing, which is another important step is I would share this and people would or would not be successful. And when it came to fundraising, people would listen and say, that's interesting. Then I put it all down on paper, if you will. I created, if you will, a, a, a starter kit. It's like Starbucks in a box. Every position, every step, every marketing material created software to actually run the whole thing. And then people started taking it seriously, developed a partnership with Medtronic. And from there, it spread across the country and across the world. We had two sites in Moscow, two in Turkey, one in France, one in Germany, and then a whole host of sites across the United States. So again, it, it, a, a lot of learning examples along the way, but you can be a little guy in a little town with a big dream and have a big impact. That's such a great story. So tell me, how, how did this lead to, where along the way did you end up joining Butterfly? Uh, what was the connection between those two? It's, isn't it interesting how life takes its turns? It really is quite fascinating. And, you know, so this program, it's called Dare to Care, and the foundation is called the Heart Health Foundation. And we had a really nice partnership with Medtronic. And part of the team members of Medtronic, we were always looking for ways to make, how do you make uh, screening for the public cheaper? And so they had discovered this company, this little tiny company out of Guilford, Connecticut, of all places, had a, had a patent submitted for, for an ultrasound on a chip. And it looked like it was something that was going to be very versatile and much more affordable. So during the, they had set up a meeting between Medtronic and Butterfly. Uh, they had had some preliminary conversations, which I, I wasn't party to, about what they could potentially do for aneurysm screening. And they invited me to a meeting with Butterfly at the, at the VEATH meeting. So I, I attended that meeting at, on the invitation of Medtronic. I sat in the back of the room. We didn't do in, uh, introductions at the beginning. So Butterfly had no idea who I was. Mm. So they go through the whole presentation. And then, of course, when they finished, the whole Medtronic team, you know, small comments, but turned, all of them turned, looked at me and said, well, John, what do you think? Is this thing credible? And I said, <laughs> it's not only credible, it's incredible. And I took out my wallet and I said, I'll buy one right now. I was so blown away about not only where they had gotten so far, but what the potential of it was. It was not an FDA cleared device. It was still in the development phase. But as it turned out, they were looking for a chief medical officer. We had some conversations. And again, as you and I kind of discussed, it's, this was one of those jump into the deep end of the pool and hope you can swim moments. 
because I pivoted my whole career uh, and joined the company as a chief medical officer and left my practice, left my position uh, and started a new career. Yep. That's uh, jumping off the deep end is, is a very scary thing. But once you, once you get out there, sometimes you find the water's pretty nice <laughs> when you're looking back. So tell me in that meeting, what was the vision that they painted for you that made the, made you say this was incredible? I know the technology probably was very impressive, but I imagine they had a vision for it as well that went along with it. And maybe you can share a little bit about what that vision was at the time. Well, I think, you know, Jonathan Rothberg was the founder of the company and Jonathan uh, is quite an amazing entrepreneur in his own right. He is the gentleman responsible for next generation DNA sequencing. So he put DNA sequencing on a chip and Jonathan's vision and uh, all of his companies, he actually has seven now that, that are in this incubator uh, up in Guilford, but all of it about, you know, technology to help someone he loves. Someone in his family would be affected by something and it would drive him to try to have a huge impact. And almost consistently, they're all about how do you make technology that's in essence limited available to the masses? And so as I looked at this ultrasound on a chip, you know, you're looking at for the first time ever, a single probe that could scan the entire body, a device that could leverage the silicon industry. And if you look through the history of the silicon industry, it has transformed whatever business that it's in, whether it's the computers itself, whether it's the cameras on your phone doesn't really matter. Anytime something's been able to be put on a chip like DNA sequencing changes the game. And so I saw that for the first time ever, that ultrasound imaging wasn't going to be a test I ordered. It was going to be something that was in my pocket. And I, I knew I could see the vision of this. And I also knew, you know, just kind of historically from the role that I played in imaging, that you look two thirds of the world has no access to medical imaging at all, at all. And so if you think about the fact that all of a sudden now an entire ultrasound system could be $2,000, that's affordable at a personal level. And then all of a sudden now doctors aren't going to have to decide, do I want to order a test? The test was in your pocket. And I could see just how that was going to change medicine everywhere. And that's why I, I changed. That's incredible. For our listeners out there, how expensive are these legacy ultrasound systems? Uh, the systems that existed before Butterfly. Yeah, if you think about the classic set, you know, even at the lowest end, it's 10 to 15 to 20,000 because you need multiple probes to scan the entire body. And the high end systems are 100, 150 to 200,000. So this is just orders of magnitude. It smashes through that ceiling from where it is an asset of the institution or the practice into being an asset of the individual. And that's really what Butterfly did. I think it's important to say with the piezoelectrics, you do need multiple probes, correct? And those probes can be. $10,000 or more. Yep, that's 20. correct. Uh, and that doesn't, that's not even the system. The system itself, I'm sure is, you know, a capital piece of equipment as well. Yeah, that, that is a fundamental change, but it didn't stop with just that, even though that was obviously important enough. The other thing was the fact that you could just connect this device to a, to a smartphone uh, or a tablet. So this was something that people were used to using and already had in their pocket. So the user interface, also the software that was written, it's incredibly simple. If you look at most ultrasound systems, all the buttons and dials, it's intimidating. It's why most people actually don't perform ultrasound because they spend half the time trying to figure that out. Butterfly's user interface is so simple. In fact, it's the only medical device to actually win uh, an Apple design award for its simplicity. So that was another piece of the puzzle that really made a difference. So easy to use, affordable, versatile, and obviously now portable, fits in your pocket. Yep, it definitely is. And I know uh, some of our Backtable hosts have used the Butterfly and it, it's impressed a lot of the techs that they've worked with for being something that you can just throw in your pocket, which is very impressive considering the price point. Now, what's your target market? Who, who's using it and what's the vision for them? Basically, every single specialty, uh, with the exception of probably pathologists that are, that are not doing biopsies. So I'll, I'll put them aside because many do their own biopsies and psychiatrists. We have sold this device to every single specialty. The interesting thing about Butterfly, because of the application of ultrasound, which is growing rapidly, really from before you're born to the day you die, for almost every single disease state, for almost every single specialty, in almost every single care venue, there is an application for this device. And so really the, the world is our buffet and we are selling this to everyone in every care venue that you can think of from the most advanced institutions in the country, biggest health systems, to NGOs serving the tiniest little communities in the most remote regions of Africa. 
to ambulances and helicopters to surgical centers and nursing homes and every kind of venue that you can think of and ultimately home care into the house. So Butterfly is just exploded onto the scenes to really leverage the true power of medical imaging. Tell us the model. So you're, you, you sell the probe for a fixed price and then you have a subscription model. Is that how it works? A yearly subscription model? Yeah, that's kind of this, this part of the other secret sauce of the company and something physicians have to, are getting used to because we're not used to that and in, in we're used to it with our telephone bill, with, with about everything else in our lives, but we're not typically used to it uh, with our medical devices. But the value of that subscription is fascinating because what Butterfly does that I wasn't used to uh, with the systems that I had historically used as a vascular surgeon was the pace at which innovation is coming. And so much of the innovation of the device, the artificial intelligence tools that we develop, the new applications, the improvements in image quality, the algorithms that we develop, all come to you via software. So you get a software update that all of a sudden, and I'll use this as a great example, we have one of the best bladder scanners out there today. Instead of typically having to run the probe over the bladder while it tries to capture the data, you put a butterfly down right smack in the middle. It does a vector scan of the bladder and in three seconds spits out the volume. That came to all the existing users once we are finished and through the FDA in a software update. You also obviously get a storage. So we have the cloud storage for the device as well. And that storage can be used to connect into your own pack system to store data. So there are a lot of features in the subscription that make it worthwhile for people. And people are just getting used to that, including educational tools, all kinds of different things. It reminds me a little bit of how Tesla works. You know, you can get a lot of updates for the car via software download that happens at night or an upgrade to make your zero to 60 time faster. Uh, and people seem to really like that kind of software. You buy one piece of hardware and then you can make it significantly better through software. I think that's a novel part of Butterfly and another one of its unique features. And, and I think it's a tremendous value add for, for physicians and all healthcare professionals as we get better, particularly in light of the artificial intelligence tools that we continue to develop. The secret between, behind AI is really, how do you solve the problem of getting their 40 million healthcare workers around the world competent in ultrasound scanning? And it's, it's around how do you capture an image and how do you interpret the image? And we're developing tools to make both of those things easier. So let me ask a, a, a tough question that I think probably a lot of radiologists are going to want to know. How do you see their role shifting? You think, I mean, you kind of mentioned it before in the sense that now you as a clinician have the ability to pull out your probe and image something, but are you necessarily sending that image out for a final read or are you just banking on the training of the clinician to, to be able to correctly use the device then incorrectly interpret it as well? So how do you see that? Well, that's evolving. And I, I think today you certainly see a lot of specialties where the physicians uh, and the healthcare professionals are very comfortable interpreting their own images. You know, we look back, ultrasound's been around for 50 years. Uh, point of care ultrasound been around for the last 10, you know, literally mostly in emergency medicine and critical care, but also in, in, in anesthesia. So we've already demonstrated that when you use it for the right applications, physicians can do those interpretations themselves. But the secret behind this is that radiologists are safe <laughs> because <laughs> there's always more complex imaging that's necessary. Butterfly used at the bedside are really most importantly used for binary decisions. You know, is, is there an aneurysm or not? Okay, the patient's in the emergency room, has abdominal pain. I'm gonna quickly use my probe and answer the question. Yes, there's an aneurysm. I still need a CT scan, you know, to do all that accurate sizing to put in an endograft. I, I can scan somebody quickly in the emergency room to see if somebody has congestive heart failure. That's a great tool, but radiologists have long known that the chest X-ray is not a great tool to actually rule in or rule out congestive heart failure because it's just not that effective. And so I think the world we see evolving is, is, is radiologists getting to live at the top end of their actually license, doing the things, the complex imaging, the advanced imaging that really require their skills. And the simple question, is there an aneurysm or not, can be reserved for people like me who I can recognize a five centimeter aneurysm with an ultrasound. Uh, I, I don't need a radiologist with me to do that. And so I think it sets up a better kind of partnership leveraging high-end equipment to answer high-end questions and simple bedside equipment to answer simple questions. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that makes sense. It's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of HeartFlow, uh, if you're familiar with the, the company that 
does coronary imaging using CTA. And what they're trying to do is basically find the patient who comes in with chest pain into the ER. If they're young, if they're low risk, you can do this CTA, rule out any type of stenosis without having to go do a bunch of negative angios. And that seems similar to me. Yeah. So Chris Zarens, who's, uh, who uh, you probably have talked to along the way, good friend, and we've known each other for a very long time. So I think heart flow is a great addition to the armamentarium of clinicians because, you know, as healthcare evolves, I think it's so critically important that we become cost effective in what we do, use the right tool in the right place. And you know, it's great to rule out something because it's a critical part of how we make clinical decisions, but you want to rule it out with the most efficient, least expensive tool possible in the earliest time possible so that we can make right decisions. I think that's been what's so transformative about Butterfly is, is it allows the tool to be in the hands of physicians right at the bedside where a quick decision can be made and the right therapy started. And I think that's the game changer. And heart flow is going down that exact same pathway. And it's a great addition to, to our toolkit. So do you see Butterfly, these probes being uh, almost like the stethoscope for medical students? When you get your stethoscope, you're so proud. Uh, you feel like you're, you're starting on this journey to becoming a physician. Do you see this being given out at white coat ceremonies or, uh, you know, for advanced practice providers? Or how do you see the training of this kind of being integrated into medical education? You know, I, I, I probably, if, if the listeners heard me say, absolutely, I see that and say, well, you're biased. You work for the company. I don't need <laughs> to say it. The medical schools are saying it for me. And so medical schools across the country, first it was UC Irvine, and then there was a second California school, and then Temple just did the same thing. And and that there's a vet school, for instance, in Texas that just did the same thing. And we're working with countless medical schools across the country who are coming on board and providing all of their students an ultrasound device as part of their education, as part of their white coat ceremony. And you can step back and ask the question, well, why would they do that? And that's because, I mean, candidly, it's so obvious. If we really, if we really were objective with one another as physicians, how good is a stethoscope? Is it really that good? If you actually dig into the data, it's kind of surprising how inaccurate it is, yet how much we depend on it. And yes, the old guard will be there that, that are really, really good and, and can listen with their stethoscope and tell you exactly what murmur it is. But I will tell you all day long, instead of listening and guessing, I would rather look and know. And Butterfly makes that difference. And so I absolutely will tell you the future will be there uh, in not too distant future that every single medical student will be trained with ultrasound technology, hopefully a Butterfly, but that is a foregone conclusion at this point. And it's basically already becoming a determinant where students want to go to school. And so ultrasound training is part of it. It's already a part of ultrasound education is a part of the curriculum for emergency medicine. You see it in critical care and the other specialties are lining up to do the same thing. It just is good common sense. A window into the body helps us make good decisions. Yep. I totally agree with you. I think radiologists live in the world of imaging gives you answers and especially when there are so little downsides with ultrasound in terms of there's no radiation. And really the, the barrier to me I see is training. And that's, you do need to know what you're looking at and you need to have experience doing it. You can learn it. Anybody can learn it. It just takes the time and it takes somebody or something showing you what you're looking at, uh, making sense out of the, the snowstorm that we all see early on. So if, if I have a vote, if you could tell uh, medical schools that they can replace histology with ultrasound, that would be fantastic. If you could just have them get rid of that part of the curriculum, uh, <laughs> that would be fantastic. Why do I feel like there's bitter memories creeping into that statement? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think you're correct. And now looking back, I'm like, I, I just not exactly sure the use unless you were going to become, a, I guess, a pathologist uh, at that point. Well, I will tell you, I tell you, Brian, you're not too far off um, in, in that thinking, because if you think about it, one of the really interesting things about Butterfly is that with a single probe, you image through a broad array of frequencies. So, you know, it's a full D array that's, that's capable of three-dimensional imaging and you have all that signal data coming back in. We're so used to structuring image the way our eyes want to see it. The future is going to be really interesting is using artificial intelligence tools. What is in that signal data that we're actually not capable at this moment of recognizing? So. Can you scan, for instance, a thyroid nodule through a broad array of frequencies, capture information that differentiates an adeno from an adenocarcinoma? 
I don't know. I can't give you an answer to that, but I'm certainly curious to see if actually that's the case. And I think there's certainly anecdotal evidence in different ways that ultrasound can be used, whether it's looking at the liver for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and others that I don't think we're that far off from answering your histology question with ultrasound. I think you're totally right. I think that's been a big field of medicine, even in, even with CT, looking at radiomics and being able to tell, uh, tell subtle aspects of imaging that our eyes just don't pick up beyond just structure. What is made up inside of those, uh, the signal, the pixels, what's there that we just can't really pull out of the data. So I'm interested to see where that goes. So from a telemedicine standpoint, are you seeing this, are you seeing this being used with telemedicine and in what way? Yeah. And I think, you know, I, it, and it's a little bit trite because I, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but telemedicine is a teleconversation until you can actually capture real data that can be, you know, change, change, if you will, the diagnosis. There's some great clinical studies that show, for instance, let's use primary care as an example, really nice study done out of England that when primary care doctors used ultrasound in the practice, it, it changed their diagnosis 50% of the time dramatically reduce their secondary images and referrals. But if you're going to change your management, your diagnosis 50% of the time with imaging, and you're starting to talk about telemedicine, sure makes sense to try to get it in the telemedicine environment. And one of the beauties of Butterfly is it makes it really easy. So early on, we developed a tool called a teleguidance system, which allows actually the expert to be remote and log on to the computer and basically see everything that that user is doing. So less trained professionals, but professionals still can be in the home, log into the system, and then they, the expert can guide them on where to move the probe. They can control depth, gain, all the different things you can do remotely, almost like they're driving a drone, and really help in the assistance of, of getting telemedicine and that imaging to the bedside. We've already met with the FDA and certainly will continue on our journey to bring imaging into the home with patients scanning themselves. That is part of the future we see which obviously can make a huge difference in the world of telemedicine. Yeah, I, having data, you're right, is, is so important with telemedicine. And I think the more data that physicians can have uh, without having to bring the patient in, the better, uh, the better decisions they can make. Now, we live in a COVID world, and I want to know how is Butterfly being used in ERs, hospitals, on potential COVID patients? Yeah. So early on in this pandemic, we, we were very active uh, and probably the place that we had the most activity was in Italy. And, and as everybody remembers, Italy was the first and hardest hit from this pandemic. And we had a whole host of key physicians who really leveraged Butterfly early in the game for the management of COVID for, for a number of what appears now afterwards to be very obvious reasons. Uh, first of which, lung imaging with Butterfly is phenomenal. It is just phenomenal. And there are some unique features of COVID that are picked up very quickly with ultra, lung ultrasound and Butterfly was able to take a role with that as well. The second thing was that you could put it in a room and sterile and cleaning the instrument, not sterile, but cleaning the instrument became a heck of a lot easier than cleaning a cart. Uh, you could very quickly clean a Butterfly and candidly, because of the price point, you could leave them in the rooms uh, in COVID patients and use them in that way. The third thing is it could be very portable and pop-up tents and the setups that we did outside hospitals. You could deploy butterflies where you couldn't deploy carts because A, they weren't available and B, they just weren't set up to handle those. And they even had devices go into the home uh, with patients that were involved uh, with physicians. So there's a lot of very early research that was done with butterfly and then clinical activity using this in COVID patients. And so it, it was quite phenomenal what role butterfly actually played in this. And there are a whole host of publications using Butterfly that talks about the role of lung ultrasound with COVID. And I imagine not just lung, because these patients are very much prone to getting uh, DVTs and PEs. So I imagine this is used for, for finding those DVTs as well. Yeah, the versatility of the probe made it really special. So it was not uncommon, for instance, in the ICU, where everybody didn't want to go into the room, that they could actually use the, the teleguidance tools to everybody stay outside the room and have someone go in and scan their legs, scan their lungs, scan their heart, particularly with all the concerns about myocarditis as well. So one probe could right. do that and everybody could be outside the room, even for line placement. It, it was very effective for that as well. So beyond the, the clinical utility, I definitely see myself just being an imager, wanting to use it for personal reasons. I, I think a lot of docs would just love to get their hands on it. And, you know, everybody's like, what's that? What is that that I feel here? Uh, let me put my probe on. 
you know, my wife was pregnant not too long ago and, and we've got a little baby boy now, but I can't tell you how many times I wanted to put a probe on and just see, see what he was doing in there, make sure everything was going okay. So are you seeing a lot of that? And, and, and I know you, you have a story as well to share. Well, I, I think we have to be cautious in that regard. I think, you know, obviously, you know, everybody worries about false positive and misinterpretation of data and all that is very legitimate. You know, I, I don't want to say that it, that it isn't. You have to be very smart with what you do. You've known that in the world of radiology from its inception, but there's also great value to be had by having the device. And so how do we balance those two things? And that's why, you know, in my role as a chief medical officer, we've moved forward cautiously in that regard. But I understand that desire to know. And, and I, I was personally there myself. So I was, I was involved when we were doing the, the final work for FDA clearance. We're at a hospital. We had a number of physicians using the device, comparing, doing the work that you think. And I noticed, you know, some fullness at the angle of my mandible that eh, that's just a lymph node. I didn't think it was any big deal. I'd recently had a cold. I was actually just going to ignore it uh, as most of us typically do as physicians. But I thought, well, what the heck? I got a complete imaging system in my hand. Why don't I just look at it? And so I put the probe up to my neck and, and literally was shocked because kind of hiding under the angle of the mandible was a three cent, bigger than three centimeter node. And that's not your everyday lymph node. And so I already was Im immediately concerned. I had, I actually had the ultrasound tech that was there who was actually much more experienced say, Hey, can you repeat this? See if you see the same thing I see, uh, which he did. And then shared it with the physician colleague that was there who said, you need a CT scan. Why don't you go get one right now? I said, no. I actually shared the image back with my physician at home and came home and it kind of accelerated everything. And it led to the diagnosis of a metastatic uh, throat cancer. So I, you know, I, I, I sometimes chuckle, you know, I'm not only a member of Butterfly, I'm its, I'm its first patient, uh, but it was a great I'm example. I'm also a user. That's right. It's the old hair club for men, right? Yep. Uh, well, that's me. And I can be pretty passionate about this because I know, you know, listen, would I have eventually made the diagnosis? Yes, because it wasn't going away. Did it impact my treatment? Sure. I mean, it accelerated the diagnosis in a huge way uh, for me. And, you know, anytime you have metastatic disease, the earlier that you find it, the better off you are, the better it leads to treatment. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm a personal living evidence that the power of this can have is, is significant. Now, obviously, the flip side of that is, you know, people get lymph nodes in their neck all the time. They're not a big deal. Do we want everybody and their grandmother getting biopsies? No. But I think as we develop this technology, we build rules around using it. Uh, we find the right way to balance the need to know versus the, you know, irresponsible use of equipment. I think we'll find that right balance. And so let's use your, your, your wife and your recent pregnancy and congratulations on the new baby. But let's assume for argument's sake, you don't live in a major city. You live in a very rural place where ultrasound in your OB is an hour and a half or two hours away, which is not that uncommon in this country, let alone the developing world. And you're a high risk pregnancy. Wouldn't it be kind of interesting for the patient to have a probe in the home that they couldn't just play with and turn it on anytime they wanted to, but they were concerned about something. They could call their doctor. The doctor would flip a code because of the software basis that turns on the device. You capture an image, send it back to your doctor. He can review it and determine whether or not there's something going on using our teleguidance system and then turn the probe off so they're not just uh, doing glamour shots. That's really powerful in the management of high-risk pregnancies and more cost-effective. And so I think there's a way to balance that world in, and we've got work to do before we get there. We're going to go safely with safety and efficacy at the core of what we do, but I don't think it takes too big of imagination to see how helpful that could be. There's always a desire for people to know and to wonder what's wrong with themselves. But obviously that can become incredibly dangerous when they start to see things that don't really exist or start worrying about things. And we could become inundated as physicians with what's this, what's this, what am I looking at? So we're really cautious in the way we're actually proceeding with this going forward. But I don't want, and this is really important when I talk to people about this, is that is that, that caution shouldn't get in the way of the progress and what this actually can do for health. Um, and so I think riding that fine line between knowing where it can be dangerous and where it can be helpful and being structured in the way in which we advance into new areas of, of availability of this device is a key part of the way Butterfly is moving into the future. And I think, you know, even in physician's hands, you know, you can imagine, okay, how good is a regular family practice doctor doing a complex echo of the heart? Well, they can't do that right out of the gate. And so the way in which we're teaching people, and this will eventually, and physicians, let's start with them, but eventually patients, is be very limited in what question you're trying to answer. I mean, I don't use a stethoscope to try to answer complex questions that it can't. 
you shouldn't do anything different with it with an ultrasound device. I can I can look at the heart and very quickly tell whether or not there's a pericardial effusion. That's easy. That is actually pretty easy. Or even more importantly, if you even don't want to go to advanced cardiac imaging, which is of harder, lung imaging is really easy. It really is. I can literally teach people how to be good at lungs within an hour. And you can recognize beelines pretty quickly. And so same thing with cellulitis versus an abscess or post void residuals in a bladder. So I think it's all about being smart as we move forward and then we take advantage of what it provides and minimize the weaknesses if we're reckless in how we move forward. So you mentioned patients in there. Again, do you envision that patients down the road could be, if there's a telemedicine visit, that you would potentially ship them one of these and maybe they, they use it on themselves during the visit, being instructed by a technologist and then now the physician has that data for, uh, for a telemedicine visit and maybe they ship it back. Do you have a vision for, for the general public using this in a, in a safe, controlled, cautious way, as you say? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I think that's a part of the vision. So I'll give you an example of, of how we're honing in on that. And I'll, I'll use, you know, one of the world's most significant health problems, congestive heart failure. You know, there's six and a half million people in the United States alone with heart failure. It has a 25% readmission rates in 30 days. It's one of the most expensive conditions we take care of, but ultrasound, particularly lung ultrasound has been shown to be very effective at actually determining when someone's wet and actually routine use of ultrasound has been shown to reduce readmission. So we've already started down that pathway. There was a study done by, by Al Chen at UCLA who actually took patients that came into the emergency room that had heart failure. They watched a five minute video about how to use a butterfly and the vast majority of patients scanned themselves quite effectively just after that five minute video, he published that in the European journal just recently. So I think this is something that patients are going to be capable of. I think monitoring chronic conditions with patients having the device at themselves at the home is a future that is not just a dream anymore. I think it's just how soon can we get there? And we'll do this in conjunction with the FDA and with key physicians. Do you see this being used for dialysis patients to monitor fistulas, graphs, flow before it goes down? Sure. And I think you can also see it being used, you know, as, as you so well aware of the fact that dialysis is moving into the home, so many more patients are doing home dialysis, a great way to do an ultrasound guided needle access. We all know that that's more accurate. And so I, I think there are a lot of great values for ultrasound and dialysis patients. I think that's a big population that we will be targeting next. Wow. That's great. So thank you for sharing that, that the vision of the future for, for butterfly, it's clearly going to change healthcare one way or another. Um, hopefully we, you know, as you said, take it slowly, cautiously, and try to avoid some of these false positives that are for sure going to come up. But this is one of those, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And I, I think they definitely seem to trend in that direction here. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I would love to just summarize briefly just a couple of points you mentioned more towards the er- the beginning. Uh, where you were talking about your personal experience and um, if you would permit me. So the first thing we talked about was knowing the difference between a product versus a company. Once again, it comes up, this becomes so important that if you have a small device that maybe isn't perfect for, uh, you know, starting a business, hiring a sales force and going out and selling it yourself to hospitals, it could be a perfect fit for a strategic company who you can leverage their resources for regulatory, for distribution and and knowing the difference between those two things can make your life a lot easier. Next, proof of concept is a really big step. If you have an idea uh, and you want to chase it down, go out there and get proof of concept first. Try to do it in a low cost way and try to do it quickly and get feedback on that. So you at least have some data that gives you the confidence to move to the next step. And that is taking a leap of faith committing to your project. John took a second mortgage so that he could pay for, you know, the, the high fidelity coding prototype for his software product in the vascular lab. And really knowing that he had proof of concept allowed him to do this. Next, you have to go all in. You have to go all in your product. Uh, You notice the one time that he admits he didn't go all in things uh, maybe didn't pan out the way it should have with this product, the way he was making it sound. So for you guys out there, you know, if you believe in it, dive in the deep end. And finally, you mentioned butterfly. Feels like it's changing the healthcare paradigm. It's changing the way we image the world. And especially in low resource settings, I think this is just fantastic. 
And I can't wait to see what you guys do, what you guys do next. So again, thank you so much, John, for coming on the show. Anything else you'd like to add to those summaries? No, Brian, I think that was great. I think you summarized it quite well. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you today and to share these stories. Awesome. Thank you so much.